special guest for this week, Roy Barakoff and Donna. Ago when I was 19. <laughs> I was a lonely person. I had no friends. I had a friend once who had a tattoo of a young lady. And I asked her for a date. Nobody seemed to want me. Till one day I went past a fruit stall. And there on top of a cantaloupe and a melon was a banana. <laughs> I looked at the banana. The banana looked at me and there was an instant rapport. Oh, I love that banana. I used, to, I used to tell that banana all my jokes and it would peel with laughter. <laughs> love didn't blind me. I knew that that banana was yellow and going out with a rotten bunch. <laughs> we used to go to football matches, five for side. Then one day, somebody stood on my banana. I held my banana in my arms, and it cried for custard. It was too late. The banana slipped away. I had other friends. I had a grapefruit for a friend, but that was vicious. It went for the eyes. And then one night, quite late, it lent. There was a knock. <laughs> there was a knock at the post and gate. And there was squatting a melon. A lovely little watermelon. How I love that watermelon. He used to roll over at everything I said. But it wouldn't eat. I tried to take it out for exercise and I bought a rhinestone collar. It had no neck. <laughs> Just kept watching television, Emmerdale Farm, Crown Court. <laughs> I knew something was wrong, it liked Jess Yates. <laughs> it grew a beard, it was filthy and dishevelled. I couldn't speak to that melon. There was no conversation. Till one day the melon leapt up from the bedclothes, hopped on the antimacassar, <laughs> drooped over the Sheraton sideboard and gripped me by the throat and said, why don't you speak to me? Say something, I said, I can't. Because you see, I'm shy, hairy melon. I'm shy. <laughs> Tonight, it's time to welcome another person who's been overlooked by the history books of Britain. Now, our guest tonight is Lord Godiver. Hello. Now, Lord Godiver, looking back over your life with a tempestuous wife such as Lady Godiver, I suppose one of the problems of living with her, such an unpredictable sort of... What on earth is going on? Oh, take no notice. It's the wife. She's going out again. <laughs> Hello. Well, as you can see, it's a swimming pool. A place where you can disport yourself aquatically and have a lot of fun. As you keep, you can at the beaches, and this is the time of the year when beaches will be crowded with young people enjoying themselves, as indeed will the swimming pool, but danger lurks, particularly for those of you who don't swim very well. One of the methods employed of trying to save people if they've been too long in deep water and have floundered with cramp is to bring them out and administer a resuscitation method we use today called the kiss... Kiss... Kiss of life. Now, this method... <laughs> now, young girls, particularly young girls, they seem prone to all this trouble. Hey, hey, because they're going to have bikinis, don't they? And they're on a show, and they come out. Ooh, <laughs> Good evening, you wonderful Anglo-Saxons. Take one, cabinet. Take five, assorted swords. And the raw courage of my protégé, 
the great Roberto. You have the ingredients of a breakthrough never seen since start of the Sunday. How do you feel, my boy? <laughs> wonderful, wonderful man. In the cabinet you go. Spit you like a barbecue. <laughs> get some bigger. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, these swords are the finest chase Toledo steel. We have one here of a great antiquity value. It actually beheaded solid in the wall maker. And it sells a very trifling sum in Pittsburgh. Now to commence the act. For those of you with a nervous disposition, I recommend a crepe bandage. <laughs> you all right, my boy? What a trooper. Folks, he'll be out of there without a scratch and harm. When you're ready, Roberto. When you're ready, son. Well, the spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. <laughs> Having children probably is the greatest responsibility that an adult can have. I've got three children, one of each, and I'm very fond of them. <laughs> very fond of those children. I don't think there's anything wrong with the kids today as, say, against 30 years ago. The only difference is they've got better weapons now. <laughs> but we try to bring them up, we try to teach them the model ethics of life, but what happens when they leave the nest, then come to visit you with their intended mate? Well, if he's the one you love, yes. Let's have a look at him. Bring him in. Don't be frightened, love. 
daughter's tongue. <coughs> Come in! <coughs> So you, uh, you want to marry my daughter? Yes. <laughs> Good, first class. Um, <clears throat> excellent. <laughs> Why not? Uh, uh, Jocelyn? It is Jocelyn, is it? That's right. I I'm Reg, by the way. Hello, Reg. Oh, my God. <laughs> So you want to, uh... Marry your daughter, yes. Uh, well, as you know, I've not had the pleasure of meeting you before, and uh, meeting people for the first time can be very queer. Uh, strange! <laughs> uh, don't you agree? <laughs> oh, very true. Yes. And I'm sure also you'll agree with me that uh, meeting people for the first time, first impressions can be often misleading, I hope. I, I hope! <laughs> I hope! that we get to know each other better as time goes on. Oh, those are my feelings exactly. What a... Oh! <laughs> oh, there. Would you like a drink? Campari? No, no, not Campari. No. Port and lemon? Have you a beer? Beer? Mm, I just love wrapping my fist around a pint. You do? <laughs> oh, good. Well, I always say there's nothing quite as benching as a good queer. Um... <laughs> Quitting is a good bench. Oh, sorry. Excuse me, Uncle. Oh, oh. I nearly tripped over that, uh, that pillow on the floor. I don't know why we have it. I don't even know why it's, what it's called. Puff. <laughs> oh, well. There you are, Jocelyn. Queers. Uh, cheers. Cheers. What a cluck. <laughs> Tell me, uh, Jocelyn. <laughs> Jocelyn? <laughs> where did you, uh, where did you meet Deirdre? Oh, at night school. Oh? Mm, just outside the flower arranging class. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose you're good with pansies. <laughs> oh, it was Deirdre. She's mad on it. Oh. Oh, I, and you were... Uh... Oh, I was coming out of the judo class next door. <laughs> judo? Yes, I'm a black belt. Oh. <laughs> Glad of it, too, some of the places I get. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I, I suppose you mean clubs and places? No, no, I just mean some of the rough characters that I meet, you know. You've got to know how to look after yourself. It's quite... <laughs> well, uh... <laughs> <coughs> Jocelyn, uh, what do you do? Do? Uh, what's your job? Oh, job. Uh, I'm a mining engineer. <laughs> mining engineer? Yes, rushing round the world, sinking shafts. <laughs> one, di one day, Mexico, the next, Sweden. I tell you, if it wasn't for the money, I'd be back on my bulldozer like a flash. Bulldozer? Oh, have another drink. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, I see. Bulldozer, eh? Very interesting, yes. What, what would you like to drink? Oh, I'll have another beer, please. <laughs> it's a boring rugger habit, I'm afraid. <laughs> rugger? Yes. You're a rugger man? <laughs> yes, London Welsh. London Welsh what? Oh, <laughs> I know what you're thinking. It's on principle. <laughs> you're surprised, aren't you? Astounding. I mean, about me playing for the London Welsh. Oh, no, no, it takes uh, off. Oh, oh, yes, you are. No, not at all. Because <laughs> I don't sound Welsh at all, do I? <laughs> <laughs> no. By God, you don't look bloody well. <laughs> now, look here, Jocelyn. <laughs> I'm Reg, by the way. <laughs> well, I hope you don't mind me speaking to you man to man, if you'll excuse the phrase. Um, you see, all, all, this, all this judo and this, this uh, 
Big fist round pint pots and sinking shafts. Well, it doesn't quite hang together with the way you're... Well, the way... Well, you, well, you are... Damn it, Jocelyn! You know what you seem to be? You came in here like Puff the Magic Dragon. <laughs> oh, that! Yeah, well, I'm, uh, I'm sorry about that. That's my sense of humour. Well, when you're meeting your prospective father-in-law for the first time, you've got to put some kind of a show on, haven't you? Shall we join the ladies? If you were the only girl in the world And you were the only boy Nothing. <laughs> Thank you for your approbation. I'd like to introduce my latest protégé, a young lady who's just returned from South Wales after a fortnight of juggling with a ton of loose soot. <laughs> When they heard this kid sing, they kept a welcome on the hillside. They wouldn't let her in the digs. <laughs> Down there, come on, kid. It's still right to know you. Oh, limit. <laughs> Hope we get the commission, kid. Never give a sucker an even break. When I'm done 
Hello, good evening. Our guest on the programme tonight is Mavis, the wife of the Invisible Man. Mavis, let me ask you this. I gather your marriage to the Invisible Man didn't last very long. Why was this? Well, I never said anything of him. <laughs> Sumps, pistons and crankshafts. <laughs> they bring fear into most motorist hearts, but they are quite forward and we'll be dealing those as the programmes go along. I'd like to talk today, though, about a more simpler problem that we come up against from time to time, the big end. <laughs> We've had a case here recently, uh, Aggie. <laughs> you can't see before oh, she's got a big end. You want to see her big end? It's like strike! It just bottled. I must get out of the sound of the tom toms. <laughs> <laughs> the memories it brings back. It's years since I was in Bradford. <laughs> this morning, a nut fell on my head. From a tree. It was a big nut, I thought. Nice one, Squiddle. <laughs> Good evening. You're looking at the last of the great white hunters. The natives call me Buana. There's not many of us left. In fact, in Africa today, you can hear the natives sing. Yes, we have no Buanas. <laughs> it's my job to take rich people on safaris, find the animal they want, have it stuffed. Have it mounted. Or if they prefer, just shaking hands. <laughs> Some animals are very hard to trap. For instance, the polar bear likes matter-fat peas. <laughs> well, all you do, you get a hole in the iceberg, scatter the matter-fat peas round. When the bear comes out for a pea, you kick him in the ice hole. <laughs> This is my gun. It's a German... <laughs> it's a German 12-bore radish model. It's a repeater. <laughs> You've got to be tough. You've got to learn to sleep in the open air under the stars. For years, all I ever had was an old sleeping bag. <laughs> Thank God she went back to her mother. <laughs> Lining a fire can be sometimes tricky. For instance, if your matches are wet, it's one of two things. Either it's the rain that did it, or you've got a cut in your haversack. <laughs> Never panic. Simply catch a couple of lions, rub them together, and you'll soon have a roaring fire. <laughs> Food is a problem on safari. Sometimes you may stumble across a dead snake or a worn-out pygmy. If you find both, you're very lucky because there's nothing more delicious than snake and pygmy pie. <laughs> Mostly we eat beans. Runner beans, haricot beans, soya beans, or if you're a cannibal, human bean. Which reminds me... How many beans? <laughs> Will you find in a tin? How many beans will there be? The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. I wrote that song some years ago for Yomo Kenyatta, and its new title of Daddy Wouldn't Buy Me a Mau Mau. <laughs> but I got on very well with the tribes last week. Last night I was playing cards with some tribes, some tribesmen. The wife said, Zulus. I said, No, 130 Bob. <laughs> the thing that surprises me is that some people are frightened of animals. I knew a chap who was frightened of the aardvark. I said, Don't be silly, aardvark never killed anybody. <laughs> That's the last time I've had the Reader's Digest. <laughs> but hunting can be dangerous. Some years ago, I was going down the banks of the River Nile with my father when I heard a crackle in the undergrowth. Out came a crocodile. Snap! Never saw my father again. 
Just like that, snap, crackle and no pop. <laughs> My most dangerous moment was in India. I was tracking down a man-eating tiger, which is like a beef burger. I tried to kill it, tried to shoot it up the Khyber. Realised suddenly I only had one bullet in my gun, but I didn't panic. I fled into a cave, and the tiger sat throbbing, waiting for me to come out of the cave. Now, I'm an expert marksman. One bullet didn't worry me. I knew that if I fired the bullet at the stone wall of the cave, a foot away, it would ricochet at an angle of 45 degrees, 3.4, on the trajectory scale of the bistolistics, bistolistics, The last time I used the wife's teeth. <laughs> the bullet would go round the old lone pine, glance up a boulder, enter the tiger's lumbar region, and render it hors de combat. <laughs> You're asking yourselves, <laughs> did I kill that tiger? <laughs> no, I missed the wall. <laughs> Gotta go now, folks. I'm taking a party out to hunt the new. GNU, very unusual animal. If I shoot three, that'll be enough. That'll be the end of the news. Here's the weather forecast. <laughs> Dr. Livingstone. Who the hell are you? My name's Stanley. Let me take you back to civilization. What? You gotta be joking, pal! I've got it made! <laughs> Dear civilization! <laughs> you take an orchestra like Sid Lawrence. You take the individual units. <laughs> the trumpet of Sid. The saxophone of Nat, that great percussion of his drummer. In fact, his whole brass section. And what do you get? Well, I don't know, but it isn't music. <laughs> but whatever it is, we're stuck with it, said Lawrence.
We live in a world of high pressure commercialism. Therefore, every company has different goods to sell and they have to sell them as best as they can. I had a friend who worked in a tailor shop, marvellous salesman. A woman once came in for a suit to bury her husband in and he sold her an extra pair of pants. <laughs> We'd like to show you now what could happen when a salesman is bent on selling a particular product. Ah, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, I'd like a watch, please. You've come to the right place. This is a watch shop. I'm proud of my watches. All Swiss precision. <laughs> and everyone tells the right time, 20 past four. <laughs> Yes, rising young executive in a world of commerce. You want to watch to match your personality? <laughs> and one that will suit your socks. I've just got the very thing for you, sir. Look at that lovely watch, sir. Shockproof. Want me to prove it? Boo! <laughs> watch never flinch, little joke. Puts the customer at ease. And now to prove that it's shockproof to the shockproof chamber, aren't we, sir? Over here, sir. You've come to the right place here. Take watch, put on wrist. Not on ankle like. Professional boxer or a shots at a contortionist? <laughs> Put on the wrist. Place hand firmly into there. Inside there, sir, is a weight to the equivalent of a £3,000 sledgehammer. When I press the switch, the weight will come down right on my wrist. Ba-boom! It will be hurt. Picture if you can. It's a lovely day. You're waiting for a bus in Rill. You're feeding penguins on a wheelbarrow. From behind a depressed area, comes a small alcoholic with a £3,000 sledgehammer. He doesn't like you. He saw you in Castle Haven, and he hates you. <laughs> and he lifts up the hammer, press it down, down! That must have hurt you terribly. <laughs> tish, tish poo. <laughs> tish, tish poo. Oh! Oh! Ah, oh! Sir, is also waterproof. And now to test its waterproof qualities. Mr. Wrigley? Yes, sir? Uh, look, look, I I'll, I'll take your word for that. Picture if you can, Trafalgar Square. You're walking across the square. It's a lovely day. The sun is in the zenith. You're walking along. One eye on the girls, one eye on Nelson. You glance at your watch and all of a sudden... It's coming down in bucketfuls. <laughs> the weather deteriorates. <laughs> it's turning to mud. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I proved your point. And then the pigeons! Oh no, please, please, not the pigeons. Cancel the pigeons! Cancel the pigeons! Cancel the pigeons! Look, I can't possibly put you to all this. Oh, nothing, sir. Watch, she's still ticking, just like clockwork. Yes, well, it would, wouldn't it? I mean. Yes, it would indeed. Watch. Which will still go beyond 40 degrees of frost. Oh, really? Picture, if you can, it's Labrador, South Labrador, in November. And there's an icebreaker going through the ice pack. There's a little man in the crow's nest who leans too far over to look at the tundra and falls into the icy waters. And yet he can still tell the time into the frost stimulation chamber. Oh, no, please. I don't think there's any necessity to do that. Perhaps I'd rather you did. <laughs> Open door. Prepare to enter. Yes, but look, I think this is going much too far. There's no necessity at all. Please, I... Watch, still ticking. <laughs> You've dropped something. Never mind, point made. Now, watch is also unsusceptible to vibration. Oh, no. Picture if you can. E.g., you've got a new hobby, a pneumatic drill. I won't, I won't. On to the vibration chamber, which can smash a man to smithering, shake him to bits in five minutes. Oh, no, please, not no. that. Not no. the vibration, please. Yes. I beg of you, don't go in there. Has to be done. No, please, I beg of you, don't... Someone help, quickly. Help! Look, I, 
I'll, I'll take the watch. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll buy it. Two pound forty-five p. Oh, a customer query. It's got no hands. No hands. <laughs> no hands. It's anti-magnetic. It's got no hands. <laughs> Why it once there for fourteen months? Well, how will I know when it's got no hands? Point taken. Reduced price two quid. But I want a watch to tell the time with. This has no hands. You're like all the rest. Well, I'm very sorry. Wasting my time. I'm terribly sorry. Get out. You overweight buffoon, get out! <laughs> Mr. Wrigley, Mr. Martin, Mr. Comstock, <laughs> Albert Johnson. It's another failure. We'll never sell the bloody watch. <laughs> Bonjour, Madame, Monsieur. La verbe française est très to be. Yes, we're going to conjugate the verb. To be, French verb. Je suis, I am. To a, you are. The interesting phonetic illustration of this is that the French, using a lot of feminine vowels, pout the lip to pronounce the words properly. For instance, to a, to a, to a. The French do pout, particularly in some to pay. Well, those birds. And the sun, they lie there, they're going, moo, moo, moo. And if you go near them, they're going to jump down. And why should they stop? Because they're ready for the shopping. Good night, everybody.